Well, now we turn uh, to what happens after Aristotle. Um, and we're going to be focusing in this lecture on four main philosophical movements that come um, not too long after Aristotle um, during uh, the period that is oftentimes referred to as the Hellenistic period. Um, now, as I think of this period, um, I'm not a historian, um, but I like to think of the Hellenistic period as um, after Alexander the Great um, dies to uh, 410 CE, uh, which is uh, the sack of Rome. Uh, but this is during the period where you have the rise of the Roman Empire. Um, so if you remember, Alexander the Great was a student of um, Aristotle, and he is responsible for um, spreading Greek culture, um, for spreading the Greek language uh, through his military conquests. Uh, but after the death of Alexander, uh, his army was divided. And the Greek city-states were on decline. Um, and you also have, during this time, uh, the Roman army is becoming dominant. And what you have during this period is really a combination between uh, the strength of the Roman Empire, uh, but also the prestige of Greek culture. Um, and so sometimes this period um, is seen as being the rise of a Greco-Roman culture. Um, so you have the Roman Empire with Greek culture uh, brought together uh, for the Greco-Roman world. And the four philosophical movements that arise during this time um, are known as Epicureanism, Stoicism, Skepticism, and Neoplatonism. And we're going to look at, at each of these mo movements just briefly here uh, before we look at um, the next really big movement that comes um, with the philosophy of uh, Augustine. Uh, but we'll start with Epicureanism. Um, so give you, to give you just a brief history of um, this philosophical movement, um, it comes from uh, the philosopher Epicurus. Um, and so he is born uh, shortly after Plato's death. And he starts a school in Athens, much like Plato and Aristotle did. Um, but his school was specifically a secular school of thought. Um, and so uh, for his philosophy... Uh, he wants it to be non-religious. It's secular. Um, now, most of the writings of Epicurus is, are lost, um, and most of what we know about him comes uh, through his followers, uh, most notably, notably uh, Lucretius. Um, but Epicureanism becomes a dominant school of thought, and we can think of this as being a practical school of thought that concerns itself with death. Um, now, one of the problems of human existence is that um, all of us know that at some point we are going to die. Um, and so there can be a fear of death, uh, but Epicureanism wants to help us get over the fear of death. Um, and it's specifically responding to uh, the religious culture of the day um, that had a fear of death because of uh, the fear of uh, what comes after death. And in Greek mythology... Um, you have uh, this figure, Hades, uh, who is the king of the underworld. Um, and even though uh, when you look at the beginnings of Greek philosophy, um, it's oftentimes common to think of this as being a move away from religious thought. Uh, but certainly there's still these religious elements in Greek philosophy, um, even though Greek philosophy is trying to focus mostly on a rational approach to knowledge. Um, we see, for example, in Plato's Republic, uh, that there is this uh, common understanding that there's judgment that could come after death. And so Plato writes, when someone thinks his end is near, uh, he oftentimes becomes frightened or concerned about things that he didn't fear before. It's then that the stories that were told about Hades, about how people who have been unjust here must pay the penalty there, uh, stories that people used to make fun of, but now we'll twist their soul this way and that uh, because there's this fear that those stories are true. Um, and so there's this fear of death that many people had in the ancient world, just like many people uh, have fear of death today. Um, and Epicurus wants to help us with that fear. Uh, he argues that such fears are irrational uh, because they're just based on mythology. They're based on Greek mythology um, we need to realize that death is just the end of a person's existence. And when we realize that, we can be happy about death. Um, now, if you're wondering, well, how would the end of existence be a happy thought? Uh, well, 
if you think about what life was like before you were born, uh, that might help you think about how life might or non-existence might be okay after you die. Uh, before you were born, uh, you have no memories. Uh, you have no existence. You have no fears. You have no anxiety. Uh, you just don't exist. And death, if death is just the end of a person's existence, um, is nothing to fear because there's no pain at that moment. There's no angst at that moment. Um, you just cease to exist. Um, and this is something that uh, for Epicurus, he thinks that this will relieve our fear of death when we realize that we're just heading into non-existence and so there is nothing to be worried about. Well, this uh, practical philosophical um, uh, perspective actually comes out of metaphysical convic convictions. Um, so Epicurus um, is also an atomist. He follows Democritus. Um, who argued that everything is made up of uh, tiny little atoms, um, an indefinite amount of atoms, and these atom atoms are eternal, indestructible, um, and so the atoms have always been here, uh, which means to say that something comes into existence or out of existence um, is just to say that things are rearranging themselves, atoms are rearranging themselves. Um, and so when we die, um, we just cease to exist as a human person, uh, but, I mean, that's just how life is. Things come into existence, things come out of existence because atoms are rearranging themselves. Um, and you might think that this perspective would uh, leave no room for the gods. But even though uh, this is a secular school of thought, um, most Epicureans still believed in gods, but they said if there are gods, uh, they are made of atoms as well. Um, and so atoms are the basic substance of reality and everything reduces to atoms at the end of the day. Um, now, as we think about how this might relate to um, ethics and free will, uh, well, Epicurus uh, argued that atoms are in motion um, and uh, for the most part, these atoms are just following uh, regular cause and effect uh, relationships. Um, so when one atom moves, it causes another atom to move, and that's just the normal flow of things. But occasionally, <clears throat> an atom might swerve, and uh, he argued that this leaves room for chance events or free choice. And so uh, a free choice and a free thought that we have is simply a swerving of an atom uh, in, in the cosmos. Uh, for Epicureans, uh, they have an atomistic view of metaphysics, um, but when it comes to their epistemology, uh, they follow Aristotle. Um, now, what's interesting about this is that Aristotle argued that uh, our knowledge comes through sense experience, uh, but it's interesting that Aristotle rejects atomism because no one at that time had had any experience of atoms. Uh, so why would we believe in an atomistic way of looking at the world if we don't experience them? Um, we don't have any visual perceptions of them. We don't hear atoms. We don't smell them. Uh, why would we believe in them? Uh, well, it's interesting that the Epicureans, uh, they held to this atomistic view of the world, and yet at the same time, they still wanted to believe that knowledge came through uh, sense experience. Um, and this actually led into their understanding of ethics. Um, they were also hedonists. Um, now, when we think of hedonism um, in our culture, we tend to think of somebody who um, goes out, parties too much, maybe plays video games, and just indulges themselves in whatever they want, whatever the whims of their um, current desires are leading them to, they just give in to that. Um, and so hedonism is this idea that the good life is the life of pleasure. Uh, but for Epicureans, uh, the good life is not this type of pleasure, um, this would be a lower form of pleasure. Rather, the good life would be more like this. It would be more like tranquility and peace. Um, finding ways to um, have restraint uh, because experience shows us that restraint actually brings more happiness than self-indulgence, um, at least in the long run. Um, so Epicureans, even though they're hedonists, uh, they would not argue that you should just give in to uh, self-indulgence, um, but rather restraint is actually a way to bring about a, a deeper form of happiness. Um, but it still is the case that the goal of life for the Epicureans uh, 
uh, is to avoid pain and to pursue pleasure. And experience can tell us the best ways to do that. Uh, but that's what ethics is uh, reduced to at the end of the day. Uh, the Stoics take a completely different approach to philosophy and a different approach to ethics. Um, probably the earliest uh, Stoic that we know of is Zeno of Cyprus. Uh, so he wanted to also promote uh, the idea of the good life, uh, but uh, he and other Stoics rejected the idea that the good life had anything to do with pleasure uh, because pleasure is comes and goes. Uh, you don't determine... Uh, what will give you pleasure, and you don't determine what will give you pain. Um, and therefore, that's just not a good basis for ethics uh, from a Stoic perspective. Rather, the good life is about wisdom, uh, which will eventually lead to virtue. And it would be nice if it leads to happiness, uh, but that can never be the thing that guides our um, approach to ethics. Uh, we want to uh, be guided by wisdom, not pleasure. Um, and so from a Stoic perspective, you want to control your emotions. Um, and, and you control them by the use of your reason. Um, that is uh, the main goal of Stoic philosophy. Uh, one of the most famous Stoics uh, that you've probably heard of is Marcus Aurelius, um, who used his Stoic uh, philosophy um, to motivate his uh, generals and to motivate uh, those who were under his military um, control uh, by saying that um, you need to control your emotions and and go with uh, fate um, because everyone has a different role to play. And this perspective uh, is uh, similar to other uh, philosophical schools of thought. It comes out of certain metaphysical convictions. Um, and the Stoics held to uh, what is called natural law. Um, now, natural law is this idea that uh, the world around us uh, functions according to physical laws. And law assumes that there's some sort of uh, order to it, uh, some reason to it. Uh, so the Stoics were materialists. Um, and yet, they also believed in God. Now, this is sometimes a, a strange combination, especially if we think of uh, materialism today in a modern context. Uh, so materialists are those who argue that the material world is all that exists. Um, and most people who claim to believe in God uh, argue that God is immaterial or God is outside the, the material world. Um, well, Stoics brought the two beliefs together and the way that they did that is they argued that God is actually in everything, uh, which means that everything is filled with reason. Uh, the natural world is filled with reason. This is what natural law is, um, and they called that, that reason the logos, um, which can be translated as logic or word. Um, so the natural world around us is uh, rational, um, and what's to, to live according to natural law then is to say that the ethical life is one that goes with the flow of nature um, and doesn't try to go against the flow of nature. Um, and this leads into their understanding of both fate and providence. Um, so fate is this idea that um, everything is determined to happen a certain way. Um, and when we talk about providence, um, it's, it's getting er, er, every event that happens, um, happens according to some sort of providential or rational control. Um, and it's the logos for the Stoics that controls everything. Um, and so this leads into uh, an ethical understanding of how we ought to live. Um, so if it's God's pleasure, the pleasure of the Logos, that you should be poor, well then act well as a poor person. Uh, because if you're poor, fate brought you to that point, and there's no point in trying to go against fate, um, you might as well uh, accept your condition and go with it. The next philosophers we're going to be looking at are the skeptics, um, and the skeptics bring up uh, what is perhaps uh, the biggest question, or at least one of the biggest questions in philosophy, um, and that's whether whether or not substantial knowledge is even possible. Um, when I say substantial knowledge, what I mean is knowing something other than, uh, say, I'm thinking right now. Um, how do we know that our thoughts correspond to anything outside of uh, what we perceive, um, that is a big question in philosophy and one that is very difficult uh, to answer. 
And we might uh, think of the question of skepticism in this way. Uh, so is skepticism a defect in the human condition that we are trying to overcome? Uh, so if we ask the question of skepticism this way, uh, then what we're saying is that skepticism is a problem. Uh, so the problem is we all know that we want to have knowledge, uh, but there are all these skeptical questions that we have that show us uh, how our approaches to knowledge aren't working, um, or we might think of it this way. Um, at this point, the skeptics would look at all the philosophers that came before them, just like the sophists uh, were looking at all the philosophers that came before them, and they, they notice that they disagree with each other. Um, all the philosophers present arguments for their positions, uh, but they're not able to persuade each other. And, uh, and so this brings up uh, skeptical concerns. Um, if all of the arguments fall short to the point that they can't convince other philosophers, then it seems like there is a defect in human knowledge. Now, is the point of philosophy to try to overcome that defect so that we can get knowledge? Or is skepticism actually the answer and we just need to embrace it? Well, the skeptics argue that skepticism is the answer. Uh, but note that skepticism is not a positive doctrine. Um, this is actually what makes it different than sophism. Uh, so skeptics are just anyone that's suspicious of somebody who claims to have knowledge. Uh, so when uh, Aristotle comes along and Aristotle argues that the forms are imminent, they're inside of the material objects that we see, and, and then presents an Aristotelian doctrine, a skeptic would be somebody that's, that's just not convinced. Um, the skeptic's not saying that Aristotle's wrong, uh, but the skeptic is just doubting whether or not this is actually um, the full truth, whether we've arrived at this point. Um, the skeptics recognize uh, the problems with sophism. So if you remember back to the sophists, um, when the sophists were looking at the early philosophers, uh, they noticed that they were uh, not able to convince each other. And so the sophists argued that there is no truth that can be known. Um, well, Socrates comes along and refutes the sophist by asking the question, well, is that true? Uh, the skeptics see the problem that the sophists have. And so the skeptic doesn't want to be a sophist. Uh, the skeptic wants to have a, a different approach. Um, and, and so what the skeptic is saying is that the rational attitude um, is not a doctrine that says there is no truth. Rather, it's just a suspension of belief. Um, skepticism is just saying, I don't know the answers, and also, I doubt that you know the answers either. Um, and so that is the skeptic's uh, perspective. And actually, they argue that mental peace comes when we recognize this. Um, when we recognize that we have nothing to prove in philosophy. Uh, philosophy for uh, the skeptic is more about the journey and less about the destination, um, whereas dogmatism is about the destination. Um, the dogmatic perspective is the one who says, I know that this is the right answer. Um, and the skeptic is simply saying dogmatism is not the answer. Um, rather, we're, we're on a journey of trying to figure things out. Um, there's probably a truth, um, but let's not claim that we've, we've arrived. Um, they actually like Socrates um, at this point um, because Socrates, if you remember, claims that there must be a truth, uh, but never claims to know uh, what that truth is. Uh, the next uh, philosophers that we'll look at are the Neoplatonists, um, and specifically we'll look at uh, one influential uh, Neoplatonist named Plotinus. Um, so Plotinus is uh, reviving Plato's philosophy. Um, that's why it's called Neoplatonism, or New Updated um, Plato. Uh, and Plotinus' version of Plato is theistic. Um, that is, uh, he argues that there is a god um, and actually replaces uh, the realm of the forms that Plato had with his conception of God. Um, and so the purpose of philosophy for Plotinus is to obtain union with God. Um, now this is similar to what Plato is saying. So Plato says the purpose of philosophy 
is to access the realm of the forms with your mind. Um, well, Plotinus says, well, what you're doing is you're actually obtaining union with God. And ultimate reality for Plotinus is God. That's what everything reduces to. Uh, or he calls it the one. Uh, and when Plotinus thinks about God or the one, uh, Plotinus isn't trying to say anything positive about God. Rather, Plotinus has a negative theology, uh, which is simply to say that we can't say anything positive about God. Uh, we can't say what God is like. Rather, all we can do is say what God is not like. Um, so we can't say that God is good, because to say that God is good is to put God in a box. Uh, but Plotinus says we can say that God is not evil, um, because you're saying that God is not this, uh, but, but saying that God is not something, according to Plotinus, is not putting God in the box. Um, so we can only affirm what God is not. We can't ever affirm what God is in a positive uh, sense. Um, all of reality for Plotinus is an emanation from the one. Um, now, if you wonder what does this emanation mean, uh, well, uh, there's a good analogy that he provides between uh, the sun uh, and sun rays. Uh, so the sun would be the substance of reality. Uh, but if you notice the rays that are coming forth from the sun, uh, those rays only exist because the sun exists. And so the sun is pure reality, and the sun rays are contingent upon uh, the existence of the sun. Um, and in the same way, the one is the mind. So... Ultimate reality reduces to the mind, or the Greek word for this is nous, and nature is simply the emanation of that. Uh, just like sun rays are the emanation from the sun, uh, nature is the emanation uh, from the one. Um, reason, then, is immaterial for Plotinus, so this is why he is a dualist, just like Plato is. Uh, Plato, uh, the forms are immaterial, uh, well, this mind, this one, is immaterial for Plotinus, and the material world that we see around us is emanating from that, uh, that one. Um, and this also brings up uh, his understanding of ethics. Um, so evil is not a thing, a real thing that exists in the world. Uh, rather, evil is just moving away from the one. Um, now, this is an interesting thought uh, that the next philosopher we'll look at will pick up, um, Augustine, uh, where Augustine is, as he's formulating his understanding of uh, philosophy uh, and understanding of the world around us, um, ethics becomes a big part of Augustine's philosophy, and evil for Augustine is also moving away from the one or moving away from God. Um, evil is not a thing that exists on its own, um, but is simply the negation of God, and that's where we will, where we will turn to next.